Happy Halloween, Evergreen Online. This morning we are on our Rosemead campus for our Fall Fest Park in the Church event as we celebrate the start of the holiday season. This morning we are going to have a wonderful time because we have a bounce house, face painting, a photo booth, games, and our main event, a petting zoo. And I'm particularly excited about the desert tortoise that's supposed to be there. Now for lunch, we're bringing in a taco cart to provide a delicious meal for us. And one of our housekeeping staff, Natalia Chinol, will be providing some homemade agua frescas for us to enjoy. So if you can join, please come on down because we would love to see you this morning. Now before we get started, I have some important announcements for us as we wrap up October and look toward November. Now, it's been a very full fall so far, and that continues into the next month with some amazing opportunities for you. Now, starting today, we will be hosting for Family Promise, one of our partner organizations that works to assist unhoused families in the San Gabriel Valley. Currently, there is one wonderful family in the program, but who knows? There could be a chance that another would, would join uh, midway through the week. But for our hosting throughout the week, individuals and groups from the church will be working together to provide meals and support for this family, either by cooking and eating with them uh, or as an overnight host where a couple of people from the congregation stay overnight and then prepare breakfast items for them in the morning. And we're so thankful for all the volunteers that have signed up, but we still need to fill one or two more slots. And so if you're interested, please contact Pastor Jonathan. Now from November 17th through the 21st, Pastor Julie will be leading a small team to Rainbow Acres, a home for adults with developmental disabilities in Mesa, Arizona. Now part of their time there will be to host a bingo night with the ranchers, uh, but the team actually needs prize donations for this event. And so if you can donate things like CDs, Walmart gift cards, stuffed animals, puzzles, and more, please contact Pastor Julie. This is a great way to participate in loving the residents, even if you can't be there physically. Now next Sunday is Communion Sunday, and it also happens to be Daylight Savings, so make sure that you set your clocks back and enjoy that extra hour of sleep but after service, we'll be gathering online and in person for our hybrid quarterly congregational meeting. We'll be voting in a new deacon, hearing ministry updates, and getting more information about our current financial deficit. If you'd like to join in person, please be sure to RSVP on my weekly email so that you can help us get an accurate count for food. Now lastly, on Sunday, November 12th, we will be hosting a conversation with Anita Yokota after service in Nagano Chapel. Anita is a therapist turned interior designer and the author of Home Therapy, which we have been using in our Becoming Homemakers journey this year. I'll be talking to Anita about the, the intersection of spiritual wellness, mental health, relationships, and home design. It's going to be a great event. Now those who sign up will have the chance to purchase her book at 40% off. That's $21 instead of the normal $35. And so please, when you RSVP, indicate whether you want to buy a discounted copy of Home Therapy. We've only ordered a handful of discounted books, so be sure to sign up soon. Now there's a lot going on in the next few weeks, and I hope you have a chance to take advantage of some of these opportunities. But now, let's continue to focus our hearts with a time of worship.
Throughout the month of October, we've been journeying through the last chapters of Ephesians in our study of what is commonly called the Household Codes. The goal of our series, House Lights, was to see the progression of Paul's epistle as the gospel works its way into the heart of the community of Ephesus, of the, the church in Ephesus. It ultimately transforms all the relationships within the household those between the adults, those between the children and parents, and those between slaves and masters. And since the Greco-Roman household was the economic, political, and social kind of building block of society, a transformation of those relationships would ultimately lead to a transformation of the entire culture. Now, I think Paul understood this and was trying to show the Ephesian, Ephesian church that the gospel needed to take root in their households because if it didn't make it in their households it would never make it out into the world now in our homemaking language we've been talking about how relationships are just critical as our friend anita yokota said it's the interpersonal relations that make a house into a home and yet as important as the connection, the playfulness, the reworking of power and the mutual reverence is to a home's relational network, all the, all the categories that we've been talking about, a good home also has boundaries, healthy, clear rules that ensure safety and increase connection. And while we take more of an open posture toward many of our relationships, sometimes we need a wall or two in order to value and protect ourselves from harm from other people. And I actually see this concept in the last part of Ephesians. Now, Paul has just finished the household codes in chapter 6 of his, of his letter, describing how following Jesus leads to a full renovation of all major relationships. Now, this is what happens when the gospel works in your life. Your life gets remade into a glimpse of the new humanity. And while one would think that this would be a welcome movement of God by everybody, sadly that's not always the case. In fact, sometimes this type of work is opposed, actively opposed. Now Paul recognizes this and writes one final exhortation for the Ephesians. And in it he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after having done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, in a sense, this is Paul's closing argument. And what he's saying is that as God builds a home by breaking down dividing walls, bringing unity and partnership to the Jews and the Gentiles in the church, genders, generations, even the master-slave relationship, as God takes this diverse household and transforms it, there's going to be opposition. And that opposition might get pretty ugly. There will be attacks, and these attacks may even come from people, people that you know. And so Paul says, make no mistake, even though it feels like this is good work, there's going to be attacks, and some of those attacks are going to come from people, and it's going to feel like you're in a struggle, struggling with those around you. 
And so he says, our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against those whom through the work of Christ are, are actually made of the same material. Our fight is against something far more otherworldly. It's against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil. Now, that sounds really spooky, doesn't it? I mean, kind of appropriately Halloween-y or Halloween-ish, right? Uh, Paul mentions these dark spiritual forces as coming from the heavenly realms to sort of describe this plane of reality where the resurrected Christ now sits and operates in opposition to this evil. And what Paul is saying is when you join the work of God to build a home, to experience new humanity, your actions and words, they, they reverberate into the spiritual world. And you may think that you are treating your spouse differently or your, your household servant with more reverence and that the impact of that is purely about deconstructing some social norms. But what's happening is that God is using you to tear down some of the oppressive world that we live in and rebuild a more beautiful one in its place. And Satan sees this and is threatened by it. He's going to attack you, and so you're going to need protection. Now, after World War II, some people saw these rulers and authorities that Paul was talking about to be, be naming sort of corrupt governments and systemic injustice. And you can kind of see how they would come to that conclusion because it does seem like it refers to sort of human strongholds of sin. And then the church should oppose these human strongholds. But scholars soon recognize that that wasn't entirely accurate because these systems and these institutions do exist in our society. Paul identifies that the actual evil is behind them. It's a spiritual power behind the human power. And so Paul tells the church, you need to put on God's armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the uh, feet fitted with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And all these things, Paul says, faith and righteousness and peace and salvation and truth and the Word of God, these are all things that Paul's actually been talking about in his letter to the Ephesians. And so what Paul's, Paul's been doing is he's been teaching the Ephesians, here are all the things that you need to protect yourself in this world from the enemy. Now, an interesting thing about this armor that Paul talks about is that, well, we often think of armor as something that we put on to engage in battle, to attack and to defend. But the Ephesians... However, the letter, the epistle to the Ephesians gives us a different image. And instead of like a joust or a duel where there's two warriors fighting each other, the epistle paints a picture of one warrior able to endure like an assault or an onslaught of arrows, to stand fast and stand strong against a bombardment from the enemy. And so the lesson is that God doesn't equip us to attack, but to defend, to stand firm, trusting that God is the one who will ultimately take care of the battle. Now, most of the epistle encourages this posture of openness and vulnerability, right? As Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, we become more open, more vulnerable, more embracing of each other because of the peace that we, we see in Christ. But as we embrace each other, as God's children on equal footing, despite kind of gender, race, generation, and social standing, the work, as we said, is going to attract opposition. Now, in those cases, when we were attacked, our posture of openness now changes to a posture of protection. But here's the gospel truth in all of this. See, as Paul talks, he, he mentions the term flesh again. And we've talked about this before in this series. Now, could it be that here again, Paul wants to remind us of this recurring point? That in Christ, we are all so united that we are practically the same flesh and bones, made of the same material. And this work that's going to attract all these flaming arrows, all these attacks that come from maybe the mouths and hands of some extremely misguided people, 
even in that situation, when you have every right to want to throw a counterpunch, to attack back, to retaliate, to do something equally as harmful, remember that these people too are loved by God. These people too are your flesh and blood. And the real enemy are the spiritual forces behind them. And you can put on the armor of God to protect yourself, but your job is not to attack. It's only to stand firm and stand your ground. Leave the ultimate battle to God. And when I think of what Jesus taught in the Gospels and what Jesus did on the cross, that approach that Paul talks about, about not attacking, that makes sense because that's what Jesus did. He never attacked. He, he left the ultimate battle to God. Now, when I read Ephesians, I feel like it's actually prophetic for us here at Evergreen because our vision comes from this book to be a home for the new humanity and we want to see the dividing walls between us be, be broken down and be united in Christ. And one of the ways that we've chosen to live that out is through our journey of LGBTQ inclusion. For our conservatives and progressives, for our queer and straight evergreeners alike, to choose to love each other as family. But it's also because of this work that this church and its leaders are verbally attacked from time to time, sometimes attacked in unkind ways. And because I'm the senior pastor here, Sometimes I'm named as the target of these attacks. Recently, it's happened again, and I have to tell you, it's, it's never fun to be attacked by anyone. It can feel kind of like a downpour of flaming arrows, like the verse said. And so what do we do when somebody attacks? No, honestly, I don't have an answer for you that's prescriptive for every situation, for every time somebody attacks you. I don't have any advice about that, but what I can say is that from where I stand right now, this is how Ephesians speaks to me. And it's saying that, you know, there's probably always going to be someone that's attacking you. But you need to remember that your real enemy is not flesh and blood. It's the powers, the spiritual powers in this dark world. And it's in those moments when you have every right to be angry, every right to retaliate, every Every, in every desire to meet these people on their level, that the gospel speaks to us again. And it tells us that even here, Jesus breaks down a dividing wall of hostility and scandalously transforms even our relationship to our earthly enemies. And so what do we do when someone attacks? We may have to shield ourselves from them. We may have to create distance. We may have to sever ties and communication. We may have to put up boundaries for our protection, put on the armor of God. But no matter how much of an adversary they are to us, Jesus' death on the cross actually establishes a commonality with them in our flesh and reminds us that the real battle is spiritual, being fought and won by Christ himself. And so here's my blessing for you this week, especially for those of you who in some way find yourselves under attack. May God protect you from the onslaught. May he heal you from hurt. And may he bring light to even your relationship with your enemies. We'll see you next week except an hour later because of daylight savings. Grace and peace to you, everyone.